a remarkable chapter of Jewish life in America, its trials and tribulations, its constant desire to undertake a quasi-prophetic mission to spread dreams of messianic waiting and redemption by establishing a poorly defined diaspora with new horizons, a chapter filled with human anxiety and Jewish hope, inspiring moral commitment and occasional moral disappointment. This is what I suggest we explore tonight as we celebrate the 350th anniversary of the arrival of the first group of 23 Jews to what is now New York, an event that, as you can see on the program, Mark Podwell illustrated with his usual or unusual talent, a biblical ship that brings homeless Jews on eagles' wings on history to a new home. I confess that this chapter is amazing because when I began studying it in depth for this evening, I realized how exceptional it is. After all, what is the story about? 23 Jews who were expelled from Recife in Brazil, where they came from Portugal and Spain, uh, to avoid and to evade the Inquisition. And nevertheless, there were four, 500 or 1,500 and 500 were to be expelled and they left, which means it was not a voluntary trip to America, which later became America. And look what occurred, what they have done, 23 people, what they have done in around 350 years. Well, I think this story is so beautiful that it's worthy of being retold. But in general, I always ask myself, how does one create a community? How does one build a village, a town, a city, or a nation? Now, normally we know what happened in America, surely. A person or a family somehow left uh, their environment and they went and went and went, and at one point they simply built, a, they took a tent out and they slept in the tent, or they built a barrack. Then another person joined them, and another person it became a family and more families, and all of a sudden it was a village. Normally, this is what happened. But we Jews are an abnormal people. <laughs> and therefore, it wasn't normal, because we never left individually. In in times of, of, of crisis and drama. It was always a group, a, a community that left one place in order to rebuild itself in another. And this is actually what we see that happened here. But the question is, what does it take for a community, for a new community to be created, to be born? Now, the fact is that the decision was then, in the 17th century to move. It was a very dramatic century. On one hand, we had the Sabbatean movement, 1648, 1616, 1660. The Sabbatean movement, which was uh, a, a cause of great, great drama, of great, great tragedy, of a debacle. It was a spiritual disaster. At the same time, we had 1648, the Khmelnytsky pogroms. The Cossacks then went from village to village, city to city, killing and killing and killing Jews. A hundred thousand Jews then were massacred by, by the Khmelnytsky uh, hordes. And so then we had, of course, the Jews who, who were in Brazil and, and wanted to leave and find other places. That was the place, therefore, that this story is being situated. Now, it began with a simple story, a fairy tale. The story of an extraordinary man, passionately involved with maps and oceans, drawn to faraway lands unknown to him or to his contemporaries. Correction. It all began on September 7, 1654, with a dramatic story about a mistaken destination, willed by destiny. A secret dream, perhaps, rooted in melancholy events in the history of an ancient people, too long dispersed and too often oppressed, 
eternally longing for a homeland? Was it nothing but an overwhelming desire of that adventurer and sea intoxicated traveler to find a refuge for future multitudes of uprooted men and women, unwanted by nations and persecuted by religious communities in most areas of the planet? Need I name the hero of our story, Christopher Columbus? Who hasn't heard of his exploits? Who hasn't admired both his audacity and imaginative powers? If we are here on this soil, in this blessed country, it is thanks to his vision of worlds waiting to be visited and his decision to go and return with exalting discoveries and victories. Was he simply a professional sailor and explorer? He was more than that. Just a loyal servant of the devout King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel of Spain, who risked his life for the honor and glory of his country? Is that the only reason for his leaving behind his family and friends, so as to lead his expedition to the uncharted territories of his exalted fantasy? Who was he? Innumerable stories and legends circulate about him. What is clear is that had he not discovered America, Jews would not have gone to Brazil, and from there, 350 years ago, to New Amsterdam. And we would not have celebrated tonight their arrival at this place. There would have been no why. Naturally, <laughs> we shall discuss its far-reaching impact on our lives now and on Jewish history in general. But for the moment, let's stop at just one episode, or more precisely, on one aspect of his departure. The date, according to the Jewish calendar, remains beyond dispute. It happened on the ninth day of Av, 1492, when Spanish Jews were ordered by the church-dominated royal court to convert to Christianity or go into exile. When the last Jews left the country, they crossed Columbus on his way to board Santa Maria, one of his ships that took him and his crew on his daring voyage, destination unknown. Was it simple coincidence? In Jewish history, I deeply believe that. In Jewish history, there are no coincidences, only encounters. And they become, maybe in retrospect, preordained. If at the moment they seem deprived of meaning, they receive meaning later. And what is the meaning? Remember, Columbus' aim was to reach not America, but India. Why India? According to one theory, he, the son of Maranos, had heard of a Jewish state created by the lost ten tribes that existed and flourished somewhere in India. So, he wanted to go there and restore a link a living link between them and their brethren still enduring exile. In fact, it was Columbus himself who admitted that the goal of his project had some Jewish connection. He wrote to Ferdinand, King Ferdinand and Queen Elizabeth of Spain, quote, having expelled the Jews from your dominions, your highnesses ordered me to proceed with sufficient armament to the region of India, end quote. But it is not to them, but to a Marano, Luis de Santangel, that Columbus first communicated the result of his historic endeavor, which was privately financed by descendants of Jewish converts to Christianity. Strange as it may sound, Columbus' intuition about the Jewish kingdom in India, rooted in bits of information, was far from being erroneous there was a kind of Jewish kingdom in Cochin, which is part of India, and it lasted a thousand years. Most of its remnants now made Aliyah to Israel in the 50s. We know now so many things about that trip, that Columbus had two sailors who spoke Hebrew. Why did he need Hebrew-speaking sailors if he hadn't thought of the 10 lost tribes. So he went to India, but disembarked in America. Far away, 
not here. But thanks to him and thanks to his mistake, exiled Jews from Spain and Portugal did find a haven in Brazil. And the first Jew to arrive in Boston in 1649 was Solomon Franco. He didn't stay long, he was chased away. The first Jews to land as a group on American soil, more precisely in New Amsterdam, which we already mentioned, was composed of 23 souls, meaning adults and children. They were expelled from Recife and they arrived aboard St. Catherine. Why? They were actually first caught by pirates who robbed them of all their fortunes, their money and their belongings. And the French boat, St. Catherine, saved them. And they had to come, they were paid later on, and they came to New Amsterdam. Peter Stuyvesant, the governor, wasn't too happy with them. He wished he could send them back anywhere because they were, as he called them, quote, deceitful, repugnant, hateful enemies of Christ, unquote. Nothing is new in history. <laughs> but his superiors of the Dutch West India Company in Amsterdam, yielding to the intervention of influential Jews, overruled him. And thus began a new chapter in Jewish history. Both similar to and different from others, fascinating on more than one level, it contains major elements of what some scholars call the mystery of Jewish survival. But before we continue our journey tonight, let's open our customary parentheses. This is the 38th year of our annual encounters at Y. Many events occurred since my first appearance on this stage. I wasn't married yet. <laughs> our goal remains the same, to study together and share our passion for learning, our quest for meaning by bringing past questions and experiences into a present filled with uncertainty. Usually we explore the hidden light in ancient sources. How did John Milton put it? There are no songs, said he, comparable to the songs of Zion, no orations equal to those of the prophets, and no politics like those which scripture teaches us. We are told the haforba, the haforba, the kulaba. Everything is in the text. The history of one idea, one precept, one law, one story, one word can link us to the origins of memory. That is why we have forever emphasized the eternal importance of receiving as faithfully and as eagerly as possible what masters and disciples have left centuries and centuries ago for us as guidelines so we may understand what often seems confused, dark, and bewildering in God's creation. But tonight we chose to deal with one event, as we said, the 350th anniversary. And of course, we know that those 23 Jews found a haven here. Were the gates open? If so, for how, for how many and for how long? But since we remain, we must, optimistic, let us say that our doors are open for the usual latecomers. For historians, the first arrival of Jewish refugees to America's shores is a fiesta. No allegory, no fantasy, no imagination, only events and facts. Facts, figures, and memories. Everything has been recorded, where they came from, for what reason they stopped here, the first marriage, the first child, the first rabbi, the first synagogue. We know so much about them that we could see ourselves almost as their contemporaries. Obsessed with memory, the Jewish people have kept alive episodes and events that mark the beginnings of many of its communities in diaspora. The story of the first is in scripture. It began with Joseph who found himself a refugee in Egypt, followed by his family. Others were to experience a similar fate in Babylon, Rome, the Rhine provinces, Poland, Russia, Spain, France, Greece, and North Africa. 
We know the geopolitical and geo-religious conditions of their migratory destiny. We know by whom they had been deported and where, and how they rebuilt communal life with memories alone. Like Jacob's children in Egypt, the few became many. They multiplied and prospered, enabling some of their great men and women to occupy high positions in the world of finance, culture, and politics. Until another enemy rose who wanted them totally assimilated or entirely absent so as to put an end to their religious or ethnic, ethnic aspirations. He isolated them in ghettos, burdened them as heretics, and or condemning them to further exile and misery. Now this is, has always in Jewish history a singular, singular discovery that whenever we touch Jewish history, somehow we reach into historiography. There is no history alone. We deal right away with some of its theological aspects, or at least with some of its philosophical exercises. With emphasis on detail, Jewish chroniclers felt it important to note that in 1654, Solomon Peterson was the first Jew to marry a Christian in New Amsterdam. Also that Asher Levi was a ritual butcher, a shochet, excused from killing hogs because of his religion. In 1655, three Jews bought the first burial places in the first Jewish cemetery. The Lopez family was the first to acquire social prominence in the early 1770s. Its founder, Aaron Lopez, a former Marano who escaped from Portugal to Newport, and remarried according to the law of Moses and Israel. Dr. Ezra Stiles, later president of Yale, spoke of him as, quote, the most universally beloved of men he ever knew. His beneficence to his family and the Jewish nation said Stiles, and the entire world is almost without a parallel. Lopez made him meet a renowned Jewish scholar and Kabbalist, Rabbi Chaim Itzhak Karigal, and Stiles was so impressed with the rabbi that he placed his portrait in the Yale gallery of important spiritual figures. And we learn how the community grew larger and larger. In colonial times, it numbered around 1,000 to 1,500 members. Right away, its internal problems manifested themselves. How to observe kashrut? There were many views on that. How to arrange communal services on the Sabbath and holidays? How to behave towards renegades or former Maranos? How to attract rabbis and teachers and cantors? They had the same problems that we have now. <laughs> the first 52-page Sephardi prayer book for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur was printed in 1751. Now remember, they arrived in 1654. The rift between Ashkenazim and Svardim couldn't be ignored. Complaints of mutual discrimination were leveled on both sides. Which tradition should be followed? Usually, in, in, in our shtetl, I remember, there were always conflicts which be used to omit and there were always conflicts, there were quarrels, sometimes there were violent quarrels. So much they came to a very famous rabbi, and the rabbi said, what do you mean? Uh, why don't you use tradition? And they said, this is our tradition, to quarrel. In 1718, Yiddish or German-speaking Ashkenazim became the majority, but the services were conducted according to Sfadi ritual. In New York, Sherit Israel, it remains Sephardi to this day. In 1730, the first official synagogue as such was opened in New York thanks to a fundraising campaign among wealthy Jews in London, Curaçao, and Barbados, and other states. In 1758, a beautiful synagogue was erected in Newport, Rhode Island. It still functions as a historical landmark. Very fast for those times, a hundred years or so later, Jews became a factor in public affairs. Jewish life in America reminds some researchers of the highest point of symbiosis 
that was attained during the Golden Age in Spain and the Weimar Republic in Germany. Who hasn't learned that both ended in tragedy? And who hasn't had a conviction that in this respect, the, Jews of, the story of Jews in America has been and will remain different from the two others? Almost from the very outset, numerous emigrants found this country special. Named only in 1912 as the New World, it became what some called the Land of Promise, and others the Golden Medina, the Land of Gold, and also Galut al Chesed, an exile of grace and compassion. But politically and psychologically, the community resembled others in quasi-similar situation. It took sides. To solve the so-called Jewish question, some chose to let their Jewishness vanish, while others believed in deepening it. Some prestigious family totally disappeared from Jewish history books. Others emerged as inspiring mentors and benefactors. During the revolution in this land, as always, Jews could be found within both camps. And the same was true of the civil war. Chaim Solomon held the revolutionary cause. Others in New York and Newport remained loyal to the mother country. The same conflict prevailed during the Civil War. In the North, Jews opposed slavery with all their heart and soul. Their humanism rooted in biblical law, favoring the stranger and against humiliation. But as in the South, Jews were among slave owners and slave merchants. Not many, but there were some. In the halls of Congress, the voice of Judah Benjamin was heard supporting the legality of slavery. There were rabbis who preached the virtue of abolition, but others may gave sermons praising the institution of slavery. However, the real debate took place around the problem of excessive integration bordering with assimilation, with the growth of the Jewish population, two million at the beginning of the, of the 20th century and its achievements in various fields of finance and culture, social success turned into a threat. What if the price for the sense of security would be too high, for it would be at the expense of Jewish identity, which would lead to its erosion? And what if the Jewish tradition would be the first victim accorded to Jews? Emancipation caused similar problems in Eastern Europe in the 18th century. When Jews profited from their newly received rights, not to build more yeshivot, but to enroll in secular colleges. In 1839, Lazarus Cohen, a teacher of Unsleben in Germany, entrusted Jewish emigrants from his city with the following message, going to America. Friends, quote, you are traveling to a land of freedom where the opportunity will be presented to live without compulsory Jewish education. Remember, 1839. Resist and withstand this tempting freedom and do not turn away from the religion of our fathers. Do not throw away your sacred faith for quickly lost earthly pleasures. For your faith brings you consolation and quiet in this life and will bring you certain happiness in the other life. Do not tear yourself away from the laws in which your fathers and mothers searched for assurance and found it. The promise to remain good Jews must never and should never be broken during this trip, nor in your life at home, nor when you go to sleep, nor when you rise again, nor in education of your children." End quote. The fears included in this letter were well founded. In the colonial period, 10 to 15% of American Jews intermarried. I'm not talking about today. It's much right. Granted, hundreds of synagogues were opened in the coming decades. Everywhere people quoted George Washington's letter to the Newport Synagogue in which he pledged that, quote, that his government will give to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance. For Jews who came from places of her persecution, these were words, great words, consoling words, healing words. 
Later, when General Ulysses Grant ordered all Jews expelled from the army, his order was revoked by Lincoln. But with the years passing, the religion lost ground among the young Jews. The conflicts of generations erupted mainly in the first part of the 20th century, but when children of East European immigrants chose to rebel against their parents' ties to their religious past and opted for anarchist theories, socialism, secular, Zionism, Bundism, communism, and atheism. Those were the years when the anti-religious Jewish daily forward, for which I used to work at one time, but much later, published then articles and ads appealing to its readers to abandon Yom Kippur services and replace them with festive dinners and balls. Those were the years when a warning by a Lithuanian sage did not sound out of place. I quote him. In America, he said, kosher food is not to be found anywhere. In America, he said, even the stones are treif, or impure for consumption. In other words, in some ultra-religious circle, people believed that to emigrate to America meant to stop being Jewish. Almost a century ago, in 1907, Israel Friedlander, professor of Bible at the Jewish Logical Seminary, delivered an address whose pessimism reflected such apprehension. The lecture was called The Problem of Judaism in America and insisted on the possibility that, quote, the benefits of freedom for Jews could bring about their de-Judaization. He was mainly concerned with the absence of great minds in the community. He said, I quote you, in times gone by, Italy presented one of the finest and brightest phases of Jewish culture. Only two generations ago, he said, it was still able to produce a personality so profoundly, so deeply, so genuinely Jewish, as Shmuel David Luzzato, and to present American Jewry in our own generation with a man like Sabato Morais. Now the condition of Judaism in Italy is one of utter stagnation. In France, he continued, where centuries ago Talmudic Judaism found its most brilliant expounders, Judaism is but a lifeless and unsuccessful imitation of French Catholicism. In Germany, we stumble on all sides against indifference and apostasy, he said. And what about America? His diagnosis is sad. The condition here, he declared, is scarcely different. He admits that there was a tremendous growth of American Judaism with its ever-increasing number of congregations and institutions. But this, he said, did not represent an organic growth from within, but the result of great minds that came from the ghettos. In general terms, he believed that American Jews were blind to the fact that the dawn of the Jews is the dusk of Judaism. That the nearer the problem of Jewry reaches its solution, the more complicated and the more dangerous becomes the problem of Judaism. That the more emancipated, prosperous, and successful the Jews become, the more impoverished, defenseless, and threatened becomes Judaism. The only reason and the only foundation of their existence. Was he right? Certain facts may prove his point. Little or nothing remained from one time Alexandria's great schools of Talmud. Then, in the Talmudic times, Alexandria had, according to the Talmudic chronicles, one million Jews with great sages who competed with the sages of, of Palestine. Has Christianity survived because it adjusted to modernity? Whereas Judaism survived because it didn't. But what about the times and places where Jews did adjust, did renounce their Jewishness? Among the first to convert in medieval Catholic Spain, it's sad to say, were small communities and their spiritual leaders. What place do they occupy in Jewish history? Which of Moses Mendelssohn's descendants remain Jewish? Can Jewish culture be severe, severed from Jewish tradition? Like Shimon Dubnov, the greatest of Jewish historians, my favorite, Friedlander believed in the spiritual and cultural power of the Jewish people. 
and not in its political influence. In spite of his pessimism predicted that America will become world's Jewry's most vibrant center, together with Achat Ha'am, Friedlander and Dubnov were cultural Zionists. Both died tragically. Friedlander was murdered in 1920 while on a humanitarian mission in the Ukraine, and Dubnov perished in 41 in the Riga ghetto, murdered by a Gestapo officer who was his former student in Germany. And one of my great dreams has been and remains to go to Riga because I have learned a lot about Dubnov. And I know from sources, good sources, that he, in the ghetto, was working on the last volume of his history of the Jewish people. And I'm sure he hid it somewhere in the ground. And I know where he lived. And I would like to take one day, I'll take a team, just to go and find it. Could secular culture of Jews save them from enemies determined to lead them to destruction? The answer is clear, he did not. Could Jewish culture save them? Could Jewish culture be saved? Will it be? By whom? A young historian, Jonathan Sarna, tells of his own experience. As he first became interested in American Jewish history, and I quote him, I mentioned my interest to a scholar at a distinguished rabbinical seminary, and he was absolutely appalled. American Jewish history, he wrote. I'll tell you all that you need to know about American Jewish history. The Jews came to America, they abandoned their faith, they began to live like Gentiles, and after a generation or two, they intermarried and disappeared. That, he said, is American Jewish history. All the rest is commentary. So don't waste your time. Go and study Talmud. <laughs> I think I know the teacher who told him that. <laughs> Obviously, the distinguished scholar was unaware of the extraordinary growth of Talmudic schools that already seemed to flourish in post-war America. Some observers speak of a true Jewish renaissance in the field of learning and culture, in literature and music, science and art, politics and academe. Jews have and had an impact on the general environment, which is disproportionate to the demographic situation, which is ours. Others go as far as maintaining that since antiquity, there were never as many Jewish schools with their teachers and students as there are now in the United States. Not even in ancient Palestine and Babylon have there been as many masters and their disciples studying Torah. Until the 1950s, Jews encountered grave and often scandalous obstacles to be admitted to the best universities in the country. Professors Chairholders in, in the Jewish studies were rare. Today, few academic institutions do not offer courses and programs in Jewish history, literature, and religion. Everywhere, classes on Holocaust-related subjects are overcrowded. Israel, Yiddish literature, and medieval poetry have never attracted as many students. In the larger context, even before World War II, American Jews did not fail their people. A strange visionary called Mordechai Noach, writer and diplomat, gathered a rally in 1824 in Buffalo and proclaimed the establishment of an Irmiklat, the city of refuge, named Ararat for homeless refugees. It didn't take off. He had three sisters who converted to Christianity. <laughs> but as an idea, it sounded exciting. When the Damascus blood libel inflicted fear and suffering on the Jewish community in Syria and its neighbors, the Jews in America mobilized all their efforts to prevail upon Washington to come to its defense. The same may be said about their reaction to the Bailey's affair in Kiev. When in the 30s, Arabs staged murderous pogroms in Palestine, 25,000 Jews filled Madison Square Garden offering their solidarity with their victimized brethren. The Balfour Declaration, promising a homeland for the Jewish people, galvanized American Jewry. To be Jewish was no longer an obstacle to success. Literature and music welcomed Jews with honors. Felix Frankfurter was a respected member of the Supreme Court. Bernard Baruch on Wall Street 
and Henry Morgenthau in presidential cabinets. Pluralism was not an empty word, nor was equality. Was there no discrimination? There was. Shameful racial discrimination towards black people, religious and ethnic disrespect from clubs, hotels, and apartment buildings towards Jews. But compared to my generation, to what it had to endure in Europe, America was a paradise. When I arrived in the United States in 1956, I was surprised to find a vibrant Jewish atmosphere. Religious in Brooklyn, culturally in Manhattan. I thought I understood why George Washington called America the promised land for Jews. Four Jewish daily papers, several Yiddish weeklies, monthly magazines, a number of Yiddish theaters proved the vitality of a culture that was, that was near extinction on the old continent. Yiddish humor invaded Hollywood and Broadway. What would really humor be today without the Yiddish, who later became, of course, very famous without their Jewish names? They changed their Yiddish names to others, but they did it. Yiddish poets were admired. Yiddish stars applauded. The forward was the largest daily, and the communist Freiheit the smallest. Naturally, they fought each other to the bitter end in matters of the ideology. The forward was more Jewish than socialist, and the Freiheit more communist than Jewish. When the bloody Arab hate pogroms erupted in Palestine, the Freiheit, the communist Freiheit, condemned the Arab hooligans and their British supporters. But shortly afterwards, ordered by Stalin, he changed his attitudes both in tone and content. His headline banner accused the Zionist fascists that provoked the Arab up uprising. It took many events, many years for the Jewish communist writers to show their disappointment in Stalin's anti-Semitism and to accept the idea that Jewish solidarity is an essential trait of Jewish destiny. A Jew, a Jew alone must not be left alone. When Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal, they were received with open arms by their coreligionists in Greece and Morocco and, 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 and Bulgaria and Italy. When Jews were targeted in the smallest village in Europe, their fear was felt by Jews in Chicago or Boston or New York. Has it always been so in our land of freedom and social justice, which was meant to be the world capital of human compassion? Is it so today? During the last 60 odd years, American Jewry centered its activity defining identity around two major themes, the Holocaust and Israel. In other words, a Jew felt himself or herself Jewish by linking their faith to the memory of the dead in Europe and to the hope of the living in Israel. Let's admit it. In general terms, many Jews in the ghettos, rightly or not, had the painful feeling that American Jews, especially on leadership levels had let them down. It began with the sad story of the St. Louis. More than a thousand Jewish refugees were aboard the ship. They had visas to Cuba, but were not allowed to disembark, so the ship was sent back to Germany. But the captain, a German, a good person, knew what the refugees knew, what was awaiting them in Germany. After all, the event happened several months after the Kristallnacht. Why not leave them in America? The ship spent days and nights not far from American shores. But Roosevelt refused. Have American Jews done enough to make him change his attitude? I don't know. Have they tried hard enough? I don't know. There are so many things I don't know. More were about what came later. At times, I moved to despair, and that's because of what came later. I say this with anguish and sorrow. Need I repeat what I must have stated here more than once, namely that I do not consider myself a judge, but a witness, only a witness. I try to refrain myself from passing judgment on others. I do not believe that Jewish leaders in the early first 40s were insensitive to Jewish suffering and indifferent to what was happening over there under the silent heavens of Auschwitz and Majdanek. Did they know? And if they did, could they have done more to move the Allies to save more Jews from the unspeakable horrors and death? Historians disagree on the answers, but I read and reread letters written in the ghettos 
And what I find in them is heartbreaking. I read and reread the commander in chief of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Mordechai Anilevich's pathetic appeals to Jewish leaders in London and America, urging them to declare mass demonstrations and hunger strikes, all political and tactical explanations why so little was done lose their human weight. The fact is that nothing was even tried. I have asked five American presidents and countless senators and representatives why the Allies did not bomb Birkenau. I asked and asked. They had no answer. But in truth, the same question could have also been addressed with equal poignancy to Jewish leaders of the time. What did they do? Surely not enough. Again, it's only an expression of sadness, not a judgment. But I have been tormented by these unanswerable questions for many years, but particularly this year, which marks actually the 60th anniversary of the extermination of Hungarian Jewry, which I will repeat it with my last breath, could have been saved. In fact, of all the large Jewish communities in German-occupied Europe, Hungarian Jewry alone could have been saved, and it wasn't. It could have been saved because it was the last, because it began days before D-Day and lasted for weeks after D-Day. Hitler had lost the war. The whole world knew it. The German nation knew it. The Hungarians knew it. The end was near. Allied aircrafts dominated the skies. There was little to stop them from bombing weapons, factories, and railways. And at that time, 10,000 Jews, men, women, and children were gassed and burned daily in Birkenau alone. Had the railways been destroyed, it would at least have slowed down the process. Why weren't they? Okay. All I can say, I don't understand. My questions remain questions. That also applies on a quite different level to what used to f I used to feel about official passivity towards Russian Jewry in the early years of our battle for their freedom. I visited the Soviet Union in 1965 and brought back a personal report on its Jews. I describe their fear, their suffering, but also their courageous struggle for hope and dignity. I told the tale of young Jews who in the thousands gathered on Simchat Torah in front of the great synagogue on Archibova Street, expressing their allegiance with fervor and song to the Jewish people and its destiny. I called the book The Jews of Silence, but it was misunderstood and surely misinterpreted. I did not say that they were I said that we were the Jews of silence. And I mainly directed my criticism at our leadership. It was impossible to move its members to action. Oh, I remember Abraham Joshua Heschel, my friend and I, would go from conference to conference, from convention to convention, trying to make them aware of what was happening in the Soviet Union without success. Most leaders had their own priorities and many excuses for not doing anything. Who came to our demonstrations? Teenagers. At best, their parents brought them by car to our gatherings and left. In truth, if the situation changed, it was thanks to the children. At one point, they prevailed upon their parents saying, you generation did not do enough for European Jews when they needed you. Let's not repeat their moral mistakes and their historical failures. In the final analysis, the Renaissance of Russian Jewry will remain one of the most spectacular triumphs in the 20th century in its Jewish history. Logically, Russian Jews could have vanished from the stage. They did not. In Israel, they now play central roles in politics, industry, the arts, and the sciences. A million Russian Jews are now in Israel. If anyone had told me when I was there so many times, that I will see that, that I will see the gates open, I would never have believed it. Which, in conclusion, brings us to the second element, Israel, which also is motivating Jewish existence in America today. How is one to measure a community's commitment to its own passion for a land and a people on the other side of borders and oceans? How is one to explain that the majority of American Jews have not even visited Israel? not even out of curiosity to, to see what the Jewish state looks like. 
How do they manage to resist this curiosity? Just to see the dream of their parents and grandparents come alive. Just to feel what a Jew feels when he or she walks in the old Jewish quarter of Jerusalem filled with prayers from the time of David and Jeremiah. Not so long ago, some leaders in Israel felt, the Jews in the ghettos had felt also, that they were let down by American Jews. It happened after the Suez campaign in 1956. It was a military triumph and a political defeat. The Eisenhower administration applied inordinate pressure on Israel to give back the Sinai to Egypt. Ben-Gurion was convinced that American Jews would rally behind Israel. He was wrong. They did not. His place to some of them went unheeded, and the response was polite but negative. Were they afraid of being accused of double loyalty? Whatever the reason, they must have felt humbled by the text. Their failure was also Ben-Gurion's defeat. It hurt him as much as the first. He then met with Baron Guy de Rothschild of France and presented him with a stunning proposal to dissolve the Zionist movement altogether, since it proved to be disloyal and useless, and replace it with a worldwide network of associations of friends of Israel. It was an outburst of anger and bitterness on his part, and nothing came of it, thank God. And today, what is the situation of Jews today in America? Is it still a different country? Say, different from when? Is it still a promised land or a land of promise for Jews, as it was then? Well, one thing is clear, that America is less popular and more popular than before, even in lands where America is being hated in Europe or in some countries in Africa and the Muslim world. Even there, most people would easily give up whatever they had, the little things they had, and just get a visa to America. Which means, from the Jewish viewpoint, it's something that we must ponder. How come that such a great nation the American nation, it's such a small nation, the Jewish nation, are hated by the same people. Those who hate Jews hate Israel, and those who hate Israel hate America. In Europe, you see all the time people going around with banners hating Sharon and Bush. And the main thing is they really hate America. I believe, naturally, that whatever, whatever we may say about our life here, things are different. Times have changed. American Jews are no longer afraid to speak up against an administration's policy in the Middle East, even when it's unfair to the Jewish state. Demographically, with the birth rate being what it is, American Jews are getting smaller in number, but not necessarily weaker in influence. We have learned lessons from the forerunners that arrived to settle here 350 years ago. The most important one being that the Jews' principal obligation in society is to remain Jewish. Our priorities must be Jewish, but without at the same time ceasing to be universal. In other words, they are to be inclusive, but not exclusive. To help another personal community of persons is an ethical commandment, but not if it means to give up my Jewishness. It is the Jew in me that is universal. To relinquish the one or the other is nothing but a mutilating, self-defeating exercise in futility. This concept has been tried in other countries and societies, but never as fruitfully as here. Now, 350 years ago, of course, there was nothing here. But now, later, young Jewish students are eager to learn where they come from. And for what purpose? They discover the beauty and the magic enrichment one finds in learning. How did the late, great Louis Finkelstein put it? Every people has its aristocracy, and we Jews have ours. Our aristocrat is the scholar. 
And so with all the challenges still before us, and with all the occasional disappointments and setbacks we may encounter in attempting at affirming the creative ingredients of our Jewishness as a factor in history, I think of America and the Jew in America with less apprehension than hope. Here as elsewhere, anti-Semitism comes and goes and comes again. It disturbs and frightens me, but it puzzles me even more. It is the oldest group hatred from antiquity to have survived antiquity. When and by what means will it disappear? Whatever it may do to change people's image of us, it must not and will not alter our image of ourselves. Oh yes, many questions remain questions. I know, we all know that much is still to be done to justify the hope of our ancestors 350 years ago. The hope they have invested in their future, which is our present. But the effort is worldwide. But what about tomorrow? How are we to anticipate America's Jewish evolution? Naturally, I'm not speaking about the next 350 years. I do not invite you to look that far ahead. Instead, I would suggest to explore a simple question which these days does contain a certain urgency. Where and at what pace is Jewish history in general, and in America in particular, going? How are we to measure its direction? Is it still going uphill? Will it be defined by the challenging embodiment of its promise or by its fears of unthinkable threats and perils? Will America replace Eastern Europe with its new forms of what used to be the kingdom of the shtetl? In other words, we are speaking not about tomorrow, but about the day after. I know the pessimists among us love to quote statistics. It seems that we are losing ground. Intermarriage, especially in small urban areas, slow, is yet an unstoppable assimilation, general negligence in matters of education. Astonishingly few Jews uh, are, are, are here ready to, to commit themselves to action. But when I came to America, it had six million Jews. Have we lost a million? Some insensitive theoreticians go as far as calling the process a new Holocaust which I cannot hear without protesting, implying that there will be a time when we shall become less than a minority. Well, I don't agree with such pessimistic outlook. We, we Jews seem to distrust and dislike statistics, admit it. They almost ruined last night's debate. <laughs> but then, also, Jewish tradition negates both the necessity and the validity of statistics. We simply refuse to believe in numbers. If we were to rely on the logic of numbers, our people would have long vanished from the surface of history. We did not lack opportunities, at times seduced by conversion, often opposed and oppressed in religious confrontations, seemingly abandoned by God and of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, vanquished by armies of gigantic empires, exiled to the far corners of the earth. In terms of pure logic, we could have more than once gone under. Wasn't that the message sent to us by history? Go away, people of Israel. We don't want your gifts nor your poison. Go, disappear, slowly, very slowly or dramatically, very dramatically. Go at your own pace or at ours, but go. When China's leader Mao Zedong heard from a visitor that the Jewish people numbered only 14 million, he's supposed to have exclaimed, what? In this land, 14 million is accepted as an accountant's mistake. Only three million in Israel? Give them a hotel, he said. <laughs> but we are still here, and how did we manage? I'll tell you. My late teacher and friend, Saul Lieberman Zal, once gave me the following explanation. It happened during the weeks preceding the Six Day War of 1967. The worldwide Jewish community lived in anguish. Personally, as a correspondent at the United Nations, I was desperate. I listened to the Arab delegates and the then PLO leader Ahmed Choukeri, Yasser Arafat's immediate predecessor, speaking freely about their resolve to throw all the Israelis into the sea, saying that will be the end of Israel, with no one in the United Nations protesting except for one, Arthur Goldberg. I believed that it could very well happen. In France, 
The great Jewish philosopher Raymond Aron published a front page editorial in Le Figaro saying, quote, I do not wish to survive Israel, unquote. Some of us, many of us, shared his feeling. Lieberman did not. His optimism disturbed me. I asked him, how do you manage to look so cheerful? Aren't you worried? Listen to his answer. He said, the master of the universe is like a banker. And he pretended to know much about banking. <laughs> when the bank invests too much in an enterprise, it can no longer let it go bankrupt. And he said, God has, for such a long time, invested so much in the Jewish people that he can no longer withdraw from it. <laughs> and he said, that's the reason, the reason for my faith. Well, it's mine too. It's mine too, my faith, my hope for America, and for America's Jews as well, and of course for Israel. Granted, we know that occasionally, on the outside of the internal pressure, there were communities that dissolved themselves, but not here. Most communities, old and new, are endowed with what the philosopher Henri Bergson called the élan vital, called it faith, awareness, sensitivity, commitment, memory, consciousness, all that to stay above ground, alive, and creative, and possessed by an irresistible urge from all of us to invoke hope, even when it seems frail, and even when there is none.